Unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. So are you feeling a little uncomfortable when you hear today's gospel? I sure am. I prefer comforter Jesus, peace Jesus, good shepherd Jesus, Jesus who loves me Jesus. Unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did, is not the kind of Jesus I like to think about. Jesus is making us uncomfortable. And today, in the midst of Lent, we are face to face with Jesus, the discomforter. After all, isn't Lent about self-examination, penitence, and a reminder that we're not alone in this world? Others travel with us, people we love and care for, people we don't like very much, people we fear, people we pity, people who hurt us. We are all on this path together. And so where are we in this scripture? Am I one of the followers who is rushing to tell Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate has killed while they were worshipping? Are we trying to figure out why, looking to Jesus to make some sense of these tragedies? Am I one of those trying to figure out if there's something about me and my loved ones that deserves not to be such a victim as these in these tragedies? Are we one of the ones who has lost someone we love at the temple or when the tower fell? <coughs> maybe I am, maybe you are. But listen again to Jesus' response. Unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. He says it twice, so it must be important. Are you feeling uneasy again? I am. It's not the response that we want, but maybe, just maybe, it's the response we need. One of my favourite books at school, GCSE, and later the film, was To Kill a Mockingbird. The story is told through the eyes of a young girl, Jean Louise Finch, better known as Scout. It's set in a small town in the southern states of America in the 1930s. Scout lives with her brother Jem and widowed father, an attorney called Atticus Finch. Tom Robinson is a black American who is wrongly accused of attacking a white woman when actually he was trying to be kind and helpful. Atticus agrees to defend Tom against these charges, even though he knows his chances of winning are slim. In one particular scene, the sheriff comes to the Finch home to warn Atticus that a mob is headed to the jail to break out Tom Robinson, and presumably to lynch him. Can we imagine how Tom is feeling? He has a wife and children at home. He's done nothing wrong. He is accused of a terrible act. He knows the reality of the situation. Atticus knows it. The sheriff knows the reality. But it doesn't matter how Tom has lived his life or how kind he is. He cannot escape the world in which he lives. In this particular scene in the movie, we see Atticus sitting on the front steps of the jail. He's sitting in a chair with a lamp, reading a book. He is sitting with Tom throughout the night. They both know that Atticus will not be able to defend Tom or even himself against the mob, but he sits there nonetheless. As the mob arrives and, and threatens to take Tom, three children appear, Scout, her brother Jen, and a friend, Dylan. Although Atticus orders them to go home, they refuse. You can see the fear in her father's eyes. But what diffuses the situation, however, is Scout's innocence in calling some of the men by name. She names their children, whom she is at school with, and for a brief moment, it becomes the great equaliser. Scout helps to see them to see that they are no different than she and her father. I think Tom must feel comfort that this prominent man is willing to sit outside his cell all night and defend him. Maybe he feels relief that Scout is calming the crowd and they're leaving. 
but he still knows that Scrub's words will not change the way the mob sees him. He has done nothing wrong, and yet there is little hope that they will see him as equal to God's creation. Isn't that just like the people in Luke's Gospel today? They are well aware of the times they live in. They know that they're in danger, Jews living in an occupied Roman world. It does not matter if the Galileans who were killed were innocent, or perhaps even worshipping at the temple. But Jesus corrects our notions that they were somehow worse than the ones who did not die. Isn't this just like the world today? We are well aware of the times we live in. We know that there is danger. Refugees crossing oceans, young girls trafficked to join brutal jihadists, Muslims at prayer. Jesus asks, do you think that these Galileans suffered in this way because they were worse sinners than other Galileans? Do you think that they were worse offenders than others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. We must all examine our lives because the reality is that we are like these people. Sometimes we will suffer when we've done nothing to deserve it. Sometimes we'll stand up for what is right in the face of opposition and be persecuted for it. And sometimes we will be the oppressors, the ones that hurt others, all the time believing that we are better than them. If we examine our lives during this Lenten season, we will see ourselves as equal participants in God's creation, so that we will not die believing that we are greater or lesser than the rest of God's creation. And then Luke moves us from Jesus the discomforter to Jesus the comforter, the gardener. In the parable of the fig tree, Jesus tells us about a vineyard owner and a gardener. The owner doesn't see any fruit on the fig tree that was planted three years ago. Fig trees are known for producing a great deal of fruit each year. They flourish particularly when cared for by experienced and thoughtful gardeners. So the owner is justified in being frustrated that this fig tree has not produced any fruit in years. Soil has been wasted on this tree. Isn't he being reasonable and wanting to cut it down? But Jesus talks of a gardener who asks for another year to tend the tree. He proposes that the owner give it one more year, allowing him to feed and nurture it. And then he agrees to cut it down if it's not producing fruit. Thankfully, when we are talking about human persons and divine grace, we do not have to worry about exhausting the supply of grace because it is infinite. However, that does not mean that we can just sit around idle and expect the Lord to continue pouring his grace upon us. The grace of God is given for a reason, to help us grow in holiness and thereby to bear fruit. God is very patient with us, knowing our weakness and inabilities well. But there comes a point, however, that when we continually refuse or squander his grace, that he will simply let us go our own way. So let's not let that happen. And instead, let's show the world God's infinite mercy and forgiveness. The strangest thing about this new political world we live in at this time is that we can no longer assume that the proposition you should love your neighbour as yourself has general consent. People have been given permission not to love their neighbour, whoever their neighbour is, whether it's the neighbour next door or someone far off, a Samaritan, a refugee, a Brexiteer. The underlying narrative that we share, a common humanity, is no longer a given. But the church's message remains, and will always remain. We are one world. Christ came to set us free from petty boundaries and nasty nationalism. Christ is the message at the heart of our freedom, and Christ is the responsibility we have. 
Christ resources us with his expression of the love of God for all the world. And Christ gives us the responsibility of telling others so that we can tell others, so that they tell others, so that in the end, the whole world will be transformed. Our responsibility here and now is to sing the Lord's song in this strange land. Our responsibility here and now is to love our neighbours as ourselves. Our responsibility here and now is to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, and all our minds. So let's do it. But let's do it too by going out beyond the church. By asserting loud and clear wherever we find ourselves, at work, at home, online, face to face, to politicians, friends and colleagues, that we are part of that one world and that we love our neighbours as ourselves. And though, uh, although of course we have to be careful, yet far more importantly, we have to be open. So let us be a church that says, we live out God among us. Amen.